I think one of the more interesting cinemas we've been watching over the last couple of years, really going some exciting directions, is Romanian. Uh, there's been a lot of talk of the Romanian new wave, and no film really sort of started those those conversations in such a dynamic way than a movie that uh, won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival in 2007 called Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days. Uh, a lot of times when filmmakers achieve that kind of stature at a relatively early stage in their career, they don't really know what, what they can do next or they sort of fold in on themselves and stop challenging themselves in, in new and creative ways. I think with the film that we're going to be talking about tonight, Beyond the, the Hills, the filmmaker in question has found a way to actually continue to push new boundaries and to evolve as a filmmaker in really extraordinary ways. Uh, so we're going to bring him out here to talk about that. Please join me in welcoming Christian Mungiu. So th in this film, we're dealing with a uh, Romanian Orthodox priest and two women who are sort of trapped in a certain way at his church, one of whom is very much uh, devoted to the religion, the other one who seems sort of uh, out of it and not interested at one point and kind of oscillates back and forth. And the film gets increasingly claustrophobic, and we're not exactly sure, you know, are these people trapped in their situation? And, you know, what, what, is, what are the true motives at hand? And my understanding is that there is some true basis for this story. Can you, can you sort of unravel that for us and, uh, you know, explain where it came from? Well, actually, um, the, the, the film is inspired by these non-fictional books that related this, that refer to this in incident. They are called non-fictional. They were written by this lady working as a journalist in that period. And what she tried to do, she tried to understand what happened after the tabloid press really messed up awfully with this subject in 2005. I think that two years later she went there, she tried to interview everybody who was still alive, trying to understand what, what really happened. And she published for the first time a couple of books that were not at all judgmental. She was trying to understand and to uh, to get the facts precisely. And the first of the books uh, recollects the first six weeks of 2005 when you see pretty much what happens in the film. While the second one tells the story of the year that followed with the trial in which these people were involved and uh, uh, finally they were convicted and they did some time and this is what the, the second book refers to. But I, I was kind of like uh, following what happens from the first moment because as you can see in the film, this is a very spectacular thing and when you open uh, the newspapers in the morning and you read something like this, you start asking some questions and all the titles were really very very spectacular it's like uh, I don't know Satan himself works for the Orthodox Church and he crucified this girl for and you said what what on earth was what w was happening over there and little by little you know I started to, to to read a lot about this and I was trying to understand how it really happened and what is all this about and so uh, reading about it is one thing, figuring out a way into writing a screenplay, which won an award at, at Cannes this year, and, and sort of dramatizing the events and creating characters from the ground up is a totally different sort of challenge altogether. What was your way into creating the fiction that came out of these, these real events? Well, first of all, I was trying to understand, you know, because the, the books would tell you what happened, but not why and how which is very, very, very different. So I was trying to figure out, for example, how would, how would violence get into a group of very calm and sympathetic people like, like they were the over there? And the other, the other thing to, to, to try and, and investigate was what was the reason of what happened? And for me, it was love. This was not in the books. This is an assumption that I made. I was trying to, to think about why would this girl, wouldn't why, why wouldn't she leave? Why wouldn't she leave the second minute after they behaved like this? And I couldn't find any other better explanation that she was trying out of love to help her friend to see that she's on the wrong path. And this is fictional, I think. 
I, I suppose, nobody knows, but I think this is fictional. And that was my way of trying to avoid the very sensational part of the story and to refer to the very human part of it as much as I could. So obviously it's a, it calls for some very credible performances. And in addition to the screenplay award that you won at Cannes, the two lead actresses also won a joint award. Mm -hmm. The jury chose to single them out as a package of sorts. So can you talk about finding the right people to play these characters? Because uh, you know th these weren't you know accomplished professionals in the, in the conventional sense of, of those terms. Well, you know they they are professional professionals in the sense that they got an education. They work as theater actors. One of them is employed as a theater actor in a theater in, in, in a town in Romania called Sibiu. The other one is still a student. They don't have any experience uh, in cinema, none whatsoever before this film. But this really didn't matter too much for me. What I believe is that for the film, you need to find the actors which are as close as possible to the characters that you designed when you were writing. This is what I'm looking for. I start the casting trying to discover some people which are naturally very much alike what I imagined when I was writing in terms of looks, but much more than this in terms of personality. But there's a connection. If I watch some pictures, I will get something about how this, not how this person is, how it could be, how he or she could be. And I was right about Christina Fluto, for example. There was something in this picture that I discovered on the internet, actually on Facebook that captured kind, you know, of um, an attitude that was very, very useful for me in the film. And after this, it's, I don't know how people do this here, but it's like a regular casting. I ask people to come. I read a few scenes, but I end up by reading the whole screenplay with the actors which stay in the last, I don't know, two or four or five. And I'm trying to see if they get it right. If they understand the logic of the dialogue from the beginning, we have chances to work together. And then I just act a lot for them and see if they understand what I want. And I don't know, I, it doesn't really matter if they have experience or not. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I'm sure a lot of directors want their filmmakers or want their actors to understand the nuances of the dialogue. But a film like this seems like a particular challenge because your formalism is something that is also uh, a challenge for actors to be a part of. You know, that you use long takes, the dialogue mm -hmm. continues for extensive periods of time without necessarily being clear about what's being discussed. There's a lot of subtext involved. It's, a I it's novelistic in a way that I think actors aren't necessarily used to, to doing. Not that's not a bad thing. In fact, it's, it's one of the things that makes it such a complicated work. But it's uh, but I wonder you know when you're shooting a film like that I, I see scenes in here that can oscillate from extraordinary suspense to some sort of state of lethargy and then all of a sudden you know it's funny I mean the the way that your tone moves is is very unique and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know how much of that is premeditated and how much just sort of comes out when you when you see the finished product. You know actors shouldn't think about the context and the subtext not at all. They should refer to the situation, and I make all the efforts so that they don't become conceptual. It's really not important for them to try to understand, you know, too much in detail how and why and for what reason they do. The only thing which matters is to refer to the truth of that specific situation. I ask them to discover in themselves something which matches the situation, because sometimes it's possible that their own background doesn't match at all the background of the characters. But apart from this, I never try to tell them in too many words what, what it's all about. They don't need to understand what, what, what's the signif significance of what they do. They need to act as if this is natural, this is believable, and this is the most difficult thing for them to do. Apart from this, of course, it's very difficult to work in very long takes. They need to be precise about everything. You know, finally, we have this feeling in the film that everything is natural in front of the camera. But we don't accomplish this by letting people improvise. Everything is very, very precise. It doesn't mean that we don't change things. We change things. And I, I watch the actors, and if something doesn't work, well, first of all, I try to make them, uh, I don't know, make them say what I think is good for the film. But if I can't say this, I will change this. 
And we are all the time trying, and we had the liberty for this film, for example, to try different, different, you know, different situations. You never know which of them is going to be right for the film. You need to free your mind and to understand that you haven't made this film already. You need to see how it goes. What I could do for them, for example, is I was shooting as much as possible in temporal continuity so that we advance in the film little by little. This is particularly a very difficult film because it involves scenes of uh, violence and aggression which can't really be explained. You can't uh, jump and shoot a, uh, directly a scene at page 35 if you haven't stepped through all the scenes up to that moment. If that scene comes naturally for an actor and for me after shooting all the others, we can do it. If not, I will just change it. And we advance in the film little by little and I understood that I have to let the film go <laughs> in the direction it in which it wanted to go. So I was pretty much changing the lie along a lot, uh, a lot in the second part of it, understanding what's natural for the film and helping the actors to, I don't know, just be, be, be in that moment that they really needed to act. You mentioned your use of long takes. It's not the first time you've done that. Obviously, it was one of the distinguishing qualities of four months, three weeks, and two days. Uh, some filmmakers think of the long take as you know, this always, you know, this master shot that requires an extensive amount of planning. Other filmmakers just sort of let the camera sit there. It seems like your ca your long takes are all over the place, but there's also a consistency to them. It, it's very, uh, very much a definitive part of, of what you do. At what point did you sort of gravitate towards using that approach, both on a narrative level and as a way of, of uh, sort of conveying the ideas of the movie? Well, first of all, this is a decision that you make when you write. If you write knowing that you're going to use long takes, you write in a specific way. And this is, this is what I do. I know I'm going to use this, so I write everything knowing where the camera is going to be. At the end, after I had the, the screenplay in place, I built all the sets, and the, cells, the sets were built so that I matched what I had in mind and I knew how I'm going to shoot, pretty much. But we don't use long takes because it's, <laughs> I don't know, easier in any way uh, to shoot just a master shot. Actually, it's way more complicated to work like this. But I think it's much more honest regarding the means that you have as a filmmaker. It refers to two things which are very important for us. The flow of time in cinema. Since, you know, all the inspiration that we get is from reality and there's no cut in reality, we can't, we can't cut off the moments that we don't like in this conversation. We have to live each other moment of reality and this is what we want to do in the film. We want to have each other scene in the film done in just one shot and this is the way we work. And it requires a special preparation of the actors and of the set and of the cameraman and everything is becomes much more complicated. And this is also a sign of, I don't know, respect for the audience. I won't signal to my spectators what is more important in the shot. I won't come closer, I won't cut, I won't say this is not important, because this is not what I see in life. In life, everything is important, and then what I do, I am try to respect this in the film. The flow of time is natural in these shots, and I, uh, you know, I learn how to do this in the film, and that everything is important, and I let the spectator judge every other shot. Well another distinguishing quality on the technical side of things is that you're not big on music. You know, I, I think uh, this film would play a lot differently if the orchestra s so sort of swelled during the more dramatic parts. Uh, can you talk about that decision? I mean, uh, you know, it's it's very much a movie that that allows you to sit in silence a lot. Well, you know, if I if I add music on this film, it's a different film, and it will feel shorter than two hours and a half. You will feel that it's you know it's it's a different amount of time. Uh, we use music on the trailer, for example, <laughs> which is very strange for us. Um, this also comes from our I don't know commitment of not abusing the means that you have as a filmmaker. It's really very easy to get emotion if you use editing and music and you generate this kind of emotion that comes from music in the right moment. And it's much more risky to try and do this only with the actors in a long take where not, you know, nothing is faked. The emotion comes from what you manage to do with these people in front of the spectators. And there's, there's no trick. 
and we think it's honest to work this way. And this is why without music, because we won't listen to any music here. You won't hear all of a sudden a music that will tell us what to feel about the situation. The whole point is that, norm what, what I believe is that you shouldn't see the director, you shouldn't see the author behind the film. You should let the audience experience this as if they witness the situation and let them judge what this situation tells them. And this is why, you know, we, we never use music. Well, at the same time, there is clearly a, a dramatic agenda at work. I mean, your films are suspenseful. You know, they build to a certain climax. And, you know, uh, bo both this one and the previous one have in the last 20 minutes or so a point in time where you're just transfixed at the screen and wondering what's going to happen next. So some of that has to be premeditated. I mean, life is not shaped in quite that way. But you have moments in life where uh, the adrenaline pumps through your veins, and I like this a lot. It's not that I don't like the effects that you get from a mainstream Hollywood film. It's only that I'm trying to get there with different kind of means, which I believe to be more honest and more cinema-like. It's my understanding of cinema. Uh, apart from this, I, you know, I really try to do with the camera and with the, the rhythm of the shot, I try to match what the main character feels about that scene. Both four months, two weeks, and two days, and these films are told from the perspective, the subjective perspective of a character. Therefore, you as spectator know as much as he knows or she knows. And I'm trying to match, you know, the 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 understanding of the main character through the camera work, through the rhythm, but a rhythm which is within the shot is not an exterior rhythm. And you know this this is not easy to do. Uh, there are some scenes at the end of the film which are like uh, pretty much uh, I don't know action adventure shots, and to try and do this in just one take with the camera this is this is not easy at all. But it matches you know the the criteria that we impose for us in order to you know to feel honest about our means as filmmakers. You know it's interesting. I, I saw you do a number of interviews with this film from when it premiered at Cannes to when it played at other festivals. You almost always get asked about the length. It's what two hours and twenty minutes, something along the, those lines. And uh, I kind of felt bad for you. You know, I mean, it's, uh, people don't seem to understand why some movies have to go beyond the ninety-minute mark. But uh, in in your situation, I mean, explaining the plot of the movie takes a lot less time than sitting through it. That's that's for sure. And and that's actually not always the case. In some in some situations, you understand what a clean three-act structure is. This one is is it has a much more advanced feel to it. So when you were going through and creating the, the structure of the film, did you have length as something that was going to be so apparent to people when they were experiencing the film? Well, obviously, since I wrote a screenplay of 240 pages, you know that length is going to be a problem. I knew it's going to be a long film. Actually, I still believe that 240 pages were the right length for this story. But you can't have um, a film which is so long because even if it works in writing and if in even if all the things are right when you when you write a screenplay, it it will f I don't know it will feel too long for people to to watch. I I decided to cut some I don't know thirty pages I think out of it, but to shoot the rest and to decide later on in post production what I'm going to keep in the film or not. So actually the first the first cut was like three hours fifteen, then the second one was three hours. So what you what you see is not so long for me. <laughs> Two hours and a half is already, you know, quite a it's reasonable. I decided at the end to just keep in the film the minimal amounts of scene scenes that I needed so that the story is right. But you know, this is the great challenge of such a story. All of a sudden I, I stepped on from making a story which happens in 24 hours, like in four months, two weeks, and two days, to a story which, I don't know, um, speaks about a, a very great quantity of facts. And you need to know all the details and the context in which they make these decisions. Therefore, it was important for me to, I don't know, give a lot of information about the background, about how people relate to religion, about uh, the history, the biography of these girls, about the relationship of the priest to his community, and all this matters as much as the main storyline in the film. And when you place all this on paper, it you know it can't be shorter than this. 
you need to have all this information so that you don't judge any of them and you consider them to be wrong before you have the time to understand why they acted like this. It's interesting because in the previous film dealt with also a sort of uh, subjective problem that only a, a few characters knew about, and this one it also, uh, you know, the, the characters of similar age and in, in, in similar mm -hmm. uh, cultures, but uh, you know, very different issues at stake. I mean, in, in four months, it really is. A, it's a film about the challenge of getting an abortion, whereas in this one, you know, you're dealing with religion. There's maybe some kind of connection there, but in the larger sense, I'm thinking that both films are very much about being trapped by these larger forces that society imposes on people who don't really have any recourse. Is, it, is, it, is there some sort of motif there that you feel is, is immensely appealing to you? I mean, is it uh, if we were to predict 10 years from now, would you still be making films that are could be described in those sort of general terms? How could I know what they will do next? I have no idea. Okay, forget about the future. Let's talk about the last two. Uh, <laughs> so the idea is Too that um, <coughs> th what you say is very conceptual. This is you know, the kind of judgment that you do once the film is finished. But I have to decide what I'm going to do next before the film is finished. Therefore, um, the only thing that, you know, that matters for me is to find a story which is strong enough and layered enough that speaks about a conflict which is very strong, very personal, that has a rhythm that I'm looking for, but at the same time it speaks about the world which is behind. Uh, this could be, I don't know, the communist period, or it could be uh, religion in nowadays society. This is not so important, but it needs to be something that concerns me. It needs to be something that I consider to be important enough so that I, I don't know, spend two years of my life doing this, bringing this in front of the audience and eventually what I hope is that these this films will trigger in the audience a desire to ponder about some of, I don't know, their own values. What I'm looking for is to make a kind of cinema in which people not only will have an opinion about the story that I bring in front of them, but will have an opinion about their own values. I'm really interested to generate this, this, this kind of uh, introspection in spectators saying, well, what do I really think about the role of religion today? Do I really make the difference between church as an institution, religion, faith, which is personal, and superstitions? The film speaks about all this, and at the same time, it speaks about them as characters. So, you know, it was compli complex enough for me to, to decide to make it. And the films are also very much about Romanian society and problems specific to what it's like to live there both now and, and over the last uh, some 20, 30 years. Uh, I wonder because after you won the Palme d'Or in 2007, y you surely received offers and, and interest from other parts of the world, including Hollywood, to at least explore the possibility of making films that weren't set in Romania. W why? What makes you stay there? I mean, why do you, why do you continue to make films about this society in particular? But wha why do you think I keep being there? Why, why do you think? Why, well, I mean, certainly there are things that speak to you about about the, the culture, but, you know, at the same time, I mean, I, I can see why someone might want to see your approach translated into other cultures. And so, you know, wh when but that opportunity is presented to okay, someone. Okay, that's, that's good enough for me. Right. If my approach... <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> the idea is that I'd like that my approach would be translated into other cultures on condition that that's my approach. But I'm not sure that my way of working would travel to other countries. I, I don't know, we work in a system in which I make all the decisions myself. I am not only the writer and director of my film, but I cast the actors, I produce the film, I edit the film, I have the final cut, I distribute my film, and you know, I pretty much do the everything myself. And therefore, this is my film, the way I conceive it. If somebody would give me this liberty of working like this, uh, I don't know, here, I would go, I would come tomorrow and look for a story. But I'm not sure things work like this. Because the way we finance films and the way we understand cinema is very different. We work with small budgets, but we have all the freedom in the world to make, m to make whatever decisions we want because we don't have any kind of commercial pressure. We don't involve private money in filmmaking. Nobody risks his own money. We use funding which is destined for cinema making. This is the destination of this money. We only appeal to this kind of money. Therefore, 
if the film is not commercially successful and can't really be, nobody's going to be upset. We understand film as an art in which we get this means to see which are the limits of this, of this art, which are really the things which are specific for cinema. And you wouldn't think that, you know, we, we really spend a lot of time thinking what's specific for cinema. What are the means which are specific for this art? And we try to place this in the films. We're not so much concerned about the story. We're, m we're much more concerned about the means of this art. I, I think this is kind of far away from, uh, I don't know, what, what people do here and what people need to, to respond to here. And therefore, you know, this is why I'm still there. And if I will ever try to have an experience uh, in a different language, it will have to be my style of, wor of working. So very quickly before we let the audience ask some questions, uh, I brought you out here and I mentioned the Romanian New Wave, which is something that's been written about quite extensively in just the last few years. Do you feel that the perception of that as a new movement is an accurate encapsulation of what's been going on just recently, or is it just sort of that the rest of the world recently discovered Romanians making movies? No, it's pretty fair to consider that. Um, Romania started making some films which matter, which are important, which are modern and speak in a modern language in the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. Uh, you know, we had cinema before, but a very different kind of cinema. We as a generation refer to that cinema in a very polemic way. I think pretty much all of us consider that what we do is a reaction to the kind of cinema which was made in Romania 10, 20, 30 years ago. But apart from this, uh, any you know labeling of this generation in such a general way would mean that we have we share a common manifest, which is not the case. We never sit at the same table and say, "Look, listen, we are going to do like this." It's like that we share some common values, but we never spoke about this very much in detail. We are perceived as a generation because, I you know, biologically we are all people mm. between forty and fifty. We all started making films after 2000 as, as a year. That was, you know, the worst year of the Romanian cinema. The first year when we were not able to produce at least one film. So we consider this to be like a border. And all of us made films o only after the collapse of communism. And we, sh we share some values in common, like this, this kind of working with very long takes, not using music, thinking about our means as filmmakers. But apart from this, there are a lot of differences. And you know, probably one of the greatest difference, the, the greatest differences that that exists among us is what we consider to be, uh, you know, that portion of reality which deserves to become film. What from from reality inspires us to make a film? This is a great difference. We have questions from the audience here. Just yeah, I'll wait for the microphone. Two questions. Um, are there anything that uh, historical that you either about Romania or otherwise that you'd be interested in making a film about, which would involve, you know, period and all the con uh, elements that go along with this? And is there any uh, concerns or subjects that you'd like to shoot? Not not because you want to do Hollywood or anything, but because it intrigues you enough that you want to work outside of Romania and do a story that's situated somewhere else. I'm not sure I, I got right the first question. If I'm if I am tempted to do a, a period piece, would you be interested in doing something historical in the yes. past? Uh, you yes. Know, uh, uh, that okay. And, and have any ideas about mm -hmm. what you know? Because Romania has an interesting, fascinating mm -hmm. history. Um, first of all, um, four months, three weeks, and two days is, in a sense, a historical piece for me, since it happens during the communist times. This is maybe just some 30 years ago, but still it's it's not today. Apart from this, there's another story which is very, very close to me and I think every time when I start a new screenplay that I'm going to do it, which is a story placed in the 40s, a story that happens in this day when, uh, you know, there was a day uh, in the Second World War when Romania had to, you know, people living in a certain part in Romania had to decide whether or not they will keep on living in their own houses sin since that part of the country was supposed to become part of the Soviet Union. So they had 24 hours to decide if they continue staying there in, I don't know, a new country or they, I don't know, just go away and see what happens to them. That day concerns me a lot and I might make a film about that day at some point. 
I'm thinking about that day when all the material things matter as much as people matter for you in life and you have to make a decision between things, objects, values and people and it might be difficult at some point to make the right decision. So yes, I'm thinking about this. At the same time, <coughs> I, I, I'm not I'm not here yet to make a story about what happens someplace else because I think it's it's decent to make stories about what you know very well. And for the moment, I have only been living in Bucharest. I have all the details that I need about the language, about people, about how people would react from stories that happen close to me. If ever I feel that I'm able to do this someplace else, I will do it. If I think that there are people that know way better than me to tell a story from here, it's up to them to make that story. All right, we have a question all the way in the back. And we'll get to you. How much research did you do for the cultural aspect? You know, we're talking about the religion, but in Romania and al also the Eastern European countries there, originally were pagan and you had the folklore and the superstition. You touched on it just a tiny bit in the movie. Is that something that you had grown up with or is it the research that you did from that countryside area? Mm. I think that you know this this story speaks a lot already from the beginning about superstition about this difference between faith and religion and superstition I don't I don't believe so much in in this kind of of research I really think that what this film speaks about is about human nature and I never felt that it's important for me to go very deep behind and try to understand, I don't know, the history of religion over there. I refer to, people's, to people living nowadays in Romania. I thought the story was clear enough and it spoke to me enough about how people can believe they are religious and still just be superstitious. The first reflex that these people have in the film is correct. They take this girl to the hospital. Once you take this girl to the hospital and you, ex you expect a response from the rational world and the response is that these people will tell you that maybe she's possessed, you need to take care of her. They will feel entitled to make decisions consequently because they are given the authority to make decisions. If this is the response that these people in hospital had, then you understand that they felt entitled to, I don't know, make decisions. I felt that everything that I need was already in the story and I felt that whatever I knew about how the Orthodox Church works and from you know my personal experience and from reading whatever I needed was enough. What I did as research when I was doing the film, I was trying to help the actors understand the attitude of these people. We brought some advisors so that actors won't feel that they don't know how things work in detail. They spent some time in, uh, the girls spent some time in a convent like this you know, mostly for the small things that you observe over there. The priest in the film spent some time with a real priest understanding how this goes. But apart from this is how you understand human nature in general. What you can project about how people think. And it's not like kind of a scientific research. I don't believe in this too much. We had another question over here. Well, it's uh, can you just wait for the microphone? So we can all hear. As interesting as the subject matter that you chose to show in both of your movies is the different countries and how we go about making our films and everything is so profit motivated in the US and you've had the benefit of your country and there's a designated budget to make artful films. Does the country limit the amount of uh, profit that goes back to you at the end of making the film? In other words, you get a, a fixed amount and then the rest goes back kind of into the system to make new films? Uh, actually, it goes like this. We get a loan. We get a loan from a state institution and uh, we are supposed to give back to the state, I don't know, part from the revenues which corresponds to how much they invested into the film. If we manage to give them back the money that they invested, good. If not, after 10 years, they will own that part of the film. That's all. So there's nothing else. 
but I, I, I truly hope that the film, the films that I make don't only speak about that country, don't, don't only speak about that religion. I don't think that this is a local film. I feel, th- I, I feel that this, this speaks about a way of understanding religion which could be here or in the Islam or wherever. I don't think this is a local story. I think that the indifference that the film speaks about is not something Romanian. It's something which is present in nowadays society. This is this kind of individualism and indifference for the other is present in you know a, every kind of Western society today. Therefore, I felt that I'm not doing a local story, but something that could speak to I don't know spectators all over the world. More questions from the audience. We have one down here in the blue shirt. I was wondering if you could talk about how you work with actors before you begin shooting, mm-hmm. if you have a process and what that entails. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do, <coughs> so before the shooting, I start reading with them a couple of scenes and then we end up by reading the whole screenplay during the casting sessions. And what I do, I I I act a lot for them. I truly believe that through acting, I check if whatever I ask the actor to do is valid or not. If you are an actor now and I'm capable of saying you a line from the screenplay and you don't know if this is a line or it comes from me, I will be entitled to ask you the same thing. If I can do this and I'm not an actor. So therefore this is what I do with my actors and at on top of you know the advantage for me is that I give them a lot of insight about the rhythm, the energy, the stress that I need much more d- precise than if using words. Words are very very imprecise when you work with an actor. And it's a matter of how you motivate people. Working as a director for a film like this, it's not easy. You need to bring people to that state of mind and energy when they are capable, for example, to make this very aggressive and violent scenes. You can't tell somebody, uh, no, no, just be, be violent. But will you be violent? It's not like this. You have to, to, I don't know, generate this kind of adrenaline that you want him to feel. You can't fake violence as an actor. You need to feel it. You need to be generous enough enough to let this violence get you. You are a nice person, you know, as as an actor. But as a character, you need to be that person. And when you do this and you do, I don't know, 30 takes during the day with this in a rhythm which accelerates from one take to the other, you need to assimilate this way of working and you need to understand that uh, I am there to help you deliver the right thing. And my way of you know, helping you is showing you this, motivating you to do this. And I'm trying to set up very much the difference between you as a, a person and you as a character. But sometimes this border is f- very flu in fiction. I keep kept telling people and especially the religious people I was working with for this film this is fiction nothing is going to come from heavens on you but when you are religious it's a bit more complicated it's you doing this you never know more questions from the audience did they stay in character while you were shooting in between these takes were they still in character were, were they did they rem- stay in their characters in between the each each take on the set or did they, when you called cut, was it, did they go back to being no. who they were? No, <laughs> it's not like There's this. Not you that know, much they, they needed, f- f- for example, for that scene, which happens uh, next to the well, to the pit, when they fight for the first time, <laughs> the level of adrenaline involved by that scene would make them, you know, they needed some time to get out of it and to get again inside it because it's it's not like this. It's really affecting people and you feel very embarrassed as a director to ask people to undergo such a process but you need to get this and they need to understand that there's no other way if you work for a film like this but it's difficult it it's really complicated and it's tormenting for the minds of people to undergo this this stress that belongs to the characters any other questions we have one right here yeah you 
I had a follow-up on the, the funding question, actually. I hope you don't mind. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the political situation in Romania. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard some talk from other filmmakers and artists about um, effects on the funding environment for the arts, because um, I know that the Romanian Culture Institute has become a bit of a pawn in the, the political um, disagreements in the country. Um, do you think that affects at all the freedom that you and other directors might have in the future? I don't know if it affects the freedom, it affects the budgets that we can access. Uh, you know what what happened with the Romanian Cultural Institute is you know a very bad example what of what happens when people are not reasonable when politics becomes more important than competence actually this was an institution that after years and years managed to work very well and all of a sudden there was a political switch and the new people that came in power decided that all the people that were devoted to i don't know the other side need need to leave and all the institutions need to be changed in a sense so they started by cutting off the budget and by uh i don't know firing fi finally everybody simply because they belong to a different system this is not reasonable honestly this is not reasonable and as much as we try with our films to make kind of a good image for that country we couldn't have any comment about this apart that this shouldn't have happened like this and this is just a sign of what happens in a country where there's a lot of passion coming from politics where there is no criteria regarding competence when you think about keeping people in their positions and preserving institutions that work i don't know what will happen later on I'm glad that you know they managed to save this uh, Romanian film festival over here through a personal initiative, but things shouldn't go like this. And uh, regarding what happens in the you know national funding, what you see here as Romanian films is always um, you know the films which from from the filmmakers that were so much well received abroad that they can't you know they can't they simply can't cannot cannot finance them. They had to, fi to, to fund them and to give them money to make films. But apart from this, I think that, I don't know, 60 to 70% of the, the funding that they have in Romania goes for films which are really very poor and very bad for me. So they don't have like a national politics about cinema, despite all the success that we had in the last 10 years. And we lost a, a lot of very good moments. We got the Spawn Door five years ago, and we couldn't we couldn't take advantage of that situation into improving uh, anything about the way we release films back home. We are going to have with all of these films more spectators in all the countries where the films are being released than back home in Romania. So something doesn't really work there very well in terms of culture. Another question right here. Uh, going back to we were talking about before with the fact that it's such an intense film and there's um, these really long takes and d how long was your schedule for the film and how many pages did you shoot a day because if it's 240 page yes. script um, um, I think we scheduled the film for 50 days which means like uh, pretty much 4 pages a day I cut off from 240 pages to, hum to some 200 pages before starting and we end up by having something like 55 days of shooting. Apart from this, we shoot pretty much regular time, like 13 hours a day, something like this. Um, but what we do, I, I normally don't do more than one major scene per day. I can't have more than one, and very often I don't have it right by the end of the day, because it's very complicated to stage it. And I will have I will make the first twenty takes of that scene during this day, but very often I have to let people sleep over it and start start all over the next day. And in the first three or four hours, I will have it right from the twenty fifth, twenty eighth, or the thirtieth take, and then I move on to my schedule. And if we had uh, I don't know simpler shots like shots without dialogue, we could do two or three scenes a day. We have time for one or two more. Anyone here? In the front row here. Oh, just wait for the, sorry. We want to make sure it's on the record. It's a basic question. What sort Very of budget? Very basic question. Wh uh, what sort of budget were you working with? Around like two million euros. 
but you know some of it came in like services but overall this is the budget that we had which i don't know for us is quite big it's the biggest budget i i ever used for here i know it's it's not too much but oh we had time for one more i think we had one right over there yep back where we started um make it good uh, no uh, also you know you use some interesting locations in this film and you've shot both in the city and you've shot in the country. Can you talk a little bit about the contrast in both the lo using those locations and how they affect the films you the, ma the making of the films and the films you make? You know, I really wanted this film to seem as if it happens today and not in the seven seventeenth century, as you could imagine if I only shoot in the monastery. And this is why I wanted to include in the film scenes that happen in town. I had many more before I decided to cuff, cut off this 30 minutes, but this is it. Um, I think that you understand better the rhythm of the life of these people if I present this at the ta same time with understanding how the rhythm in, 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 the, in the town is. And this is why I wanted to have a, a, a mix of, of having scenes in the monastery and scenes that happen at the same time in so-called, you know, regular city life. Still, we speak about a very, very small town where nothing much happens very often, but this is the reality of the place. And it's fair to understand that these people live a contemporary life. They use mobiles and still their way of life I don't know, it's the one that you see in the film, and this coexists with, and some, this is not, uh, I, I, don't, I don't judge them in any way, and I'm not saying that it's better to live in town in such a small town, and this is in any way superior to living in a monastery. All right, so if you haven't seen the film yet, your next opportunity is, uh, if not at the festival, then when IFC Films releases it, which is, what's the release date for New York? I think f beginning of February. The beginning of February. But by then, if somebody is very curious, it's going there's going to be this Romanian Film Festival in November at the Lincoln Center, so who wants to see the film before the release can watch it there. So in the meantime, you have the trailer, but remember that music isn't in the film. Thank you very much. Thank you.